Brayden, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks, man. Awesome. So you got our attention a while ago because uh, there was a, a clip from uh, one of our podcasts where we were talking about, I think it was me, well, I was talking about the deadlift and how yep. great of a work exercise it was to develop the back and then some numb nuts. Influencer. <laughs> he's actually a pretty uh, popular kid on TikTok. I think, yeah. Right? He's, he's, he's popular for the wrong reasons. We'll put it that way. Yeah. yeah. And so, and he was like trying to talk about, and I, you know, I've heard this argument before, the biomechanics of the lats, it's not yeah. a back exercise, blah, sure. blah, blah. And he's trying to take down the video and, and then you did yeah. like a takedown of what he said. Deadlift is a exceptional exercise. And it does build a lot of muscle. Okay, you ask anybody who's been not really very yes, experienced really. with the deadlift, who's been training people for a long time. Training uh, age is not indicative benefits. of knowledge. Yeah, it I absolutely know studies is. That will say a barbell row is better for this, or a pull up is better for that. But overall, um, and this is one of the things that we have to consider when we look at exercises: what's their carryover to other exercises, and what does that mean? This Crossover a, neural and strength adaptation does not matter for hypertrophy. And it absolutely does. Exercises that allow you to handle the load. That a deadlift load is irrelevant. In fact, we cannot use load to quantify mechanical tension. The heaviest exercise <laughs> it is absolutely relevant. And the matter. amount of tension that that creates in the posture. Isometric stimulus is inferior to isotonic contractions where you're moving through a large range of motion. Not load. the point. You're get it with a pull up. What places that kind of demand on your body? Nothing. Literally nothing anything else. else. Nothing. Compares. Nothing works no. supposed to your chain as, as as well as a, as a deadlift does. Here's where That's this cap. argument Not cap. Okay. <laughs> if you were to talk about. So it got our attention and we're like, okay, this is cool. And the way you explained yourself um, was very um, intelligent, but also uh, easy to understand, which is, um, it's hard to find that combination in our space. So we went through your stuff, you know, who is this guy? And we found that you do a really good job. And one thing we're trying to do um, on the show, and we've done this since we started, but um, trying to do more of it even now is highlight good coaches and trainers in our space. So mm. people have more good people to follow because there's not a lot out sure. there. The fitness space is pretty, well, it's pretty wild yeah. Yeah, as, as you already know. So that's why we have you on the show, man. So, well, oh, thanks for having yeah, me. Man. Thanks for the yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your history. You've, you've been a trainer for over a decade. I, I hear you saying your videos coming and, up on 10 years. Okay. Yeah. How did you start and what got you in the like social media space? Yeah. So, uh, Rewind back to high school. I, I, I worked on a farm my whole childhood and teenage years, and I was always the weakest one on the farm. I was the run of the litter. And so I was like, I need to I need to throw bales of hay faster than these guys. So I got into strength training uh, in my senior year of high school, <clears throat> got into powerlifting. And what I found is I was getting into powerlifting. I really enjoyed teaching other people how to do it as well. I, that was a really big passion of mine. And like through my whole high school, you know, I taught people how to swim, how to snowboard, you know, how to do all these different things. And I really enjoyed watching other people accomplish things. So all through, uh, you know, going through college, I got to intern with some of the strength coaches at the universities. And then I uh, went on to compete in powerlifting from there. Um, and then I found a really stupid sport called strongman. And <laughs> it, I say it's stupid because it's literally who can pick up the most awkward object for the most amount of weight for the most amount of reps, the fastest amount of time yeah. right? uh, without insane. blowing your back out. So I got into that, fell in love with it. And where I was living at the time, some of the world's strongest competitors lived in that area as well. So I was really lucky to, uh, like be their pupil and got to train with them and work with them. And so from there, uh, got more into strength training, worked with more uh, big names, mentored uh, mentored with some of like the really big names in the strength world. And here we are. Hmm. So, yeah. And what made you go the social media route? That's how you make money. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> he's like, hey, bro, he's not 45 like you. That's why. He's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Un like, unfortunately, in this day and age, you have to be on social yeah. media to, to make a name for yourself. Um, but uh I, yeah, I mean, you know, frankly, like, honestly, I, I don't really like social media that much, but mm -hmm. I do it because I have to. Were you so. on it as a kid in high school? Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I love I love listening to somebody's journey because we are uh, a bunch of old fuddy duddies that didn't exist when we were in high school. Sure. What was uh, what was your journey of using social media originally, probably as a way to hang out, talk to people and stuff like that. And then the transition into utilizing it as a tool to build a business. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean. When, when it, when, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, all those kind of came out, I was still really young. And so what I ended up doing is just using that to just post, I got this new PR. I just did this on my squat. And then I noticed people started commenting 
like, Hey, you can squat. Can you teach me how to squat? Or like, and so I started using it as a space to like debunk some of the big fitness things. And then it just kind of grew from there. And then I learned that, um, while I have my personal training business here on the side, I can also use social media to reach a much greater audience at the same time, an international audience. So was that not the intent right out the gates? Were you just sharing to share? And then you realized I was just sharing to share, just teaching because I love teaching. And then all of a sudden I figured out, oh, social media, I can use this to make money off of this and actually like have before online coaching was a thing. I could use it as an online coaching tool. Now, I don't know this, but it it seems obvious to us that you've coached in person uh, a lot more or first. Is that Mm -hmm. okay? hundred percent. I was in the trenches and I think anybody who wants to be a successful coach, you have to be in person. You have to be explain in that. Why yeah. Yeah, we talk we about agree. that a lot. You will learn invaluable lessons from working one-on-one with an individual, both tactile cues lessons. Uh, you will see the reactions in someone's face when they get it. You can't learn that from going from a textbook to just speaking on camera and just doing things online. Everybody wants to be an online coach because it's easy. Right. But you have to earn your right to do that. You have to work in the trenches and you have to learn those lessons along the way of how can I make this work for someone before you can have the, dare I say, authority to move into the online world. So, yeah, cues, uh, just just cues, for example, which is just one piece of this, like cueing an exercise. um, I couldn't imagine learning how to cue properly virtually. I had to learn how to cue Mm -hmm. properly virtually. I learned that in person because. When you're working with someone, you cue one way, you cue a different way. Cue, and then you see, oh, this is what works. This is what gets the person kind of right. moving this direction, saying it this way or noticing a particular movement pattern and saying it this way. But if I did that online, I there's no way I would have figured that out. I would have no. said stuff like, oh, pull your shoulders down rather than, you know, pull your chest up to the bar, for example. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. Like. I need to see more lumbar extension. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What does what? that mean? Nobody yeah. knows. Yeah. Yeah. Point your butthole up to the sky. There we go. Now yeah. we got it. Right. So you don't learn that from a textbook. You, right. have, you learn that from working one-on-one with thousands of people in person, all built so differently. That's how you figure that out. And you have to, I don't know, man, there's so many invaluable lessons that come from one-on-one and honestly, like now, so with my business, like I only do uh, online right now. I'm considering just renting out a spot at a local CrossFit box just so I can hone those skills because I can tell I'm kind of getting a little rusty on my on my coaching and my cues. So I want to go back to the one on one so I can continue to improve. I've kept one client mm-hmm. just because of that. Yeah. Just to keep me grounded and rem- remind me. And I crazy what have 20 something years been doing this. It still provides me content for on here because, you know, she comes up with something and now she's sure. been training forever. And there's and I'm like, oh, man, I forget like. You know, we talk on this damn podcast yeah. all the time. I forget how how simple a little cue or tip like that could change her movement pattern 100%. or even like yeah. her habits around in gym, nutrition, all the above. Like, no, it's wild what a difference that makes. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway, MAPS 15 Minutes. This is a muscle building, strength building program. Only takes 15 to 20 minutes a day. Every single day, 15 to 20 minutes, and you get phenomenal results program. Again, you can win it. Here's how you can win it. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it here on YouTube. This helps us with the algorithm. Also subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If we think you're the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, we put together a time crunch maps program bundle. This includes maps, 15 minutes, maps, anywhere maps, prime and the ebook eat for performance all together in one bundle discounted over $200 off. That's happening only this month. If you're interested or you just want to learn more, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Did you start at a big box gym? A small, what kind of gym did you start off at? Yeah, so um, I hopped from gym to gym. Uh, my first ones were like just a big franchise, one of their in-house uh, trainers. Didn't like that. And I, that was when I came like exposed to kind of the the structure of these big box gyms and how they make money. And I was like, I don't like this. Talk about that. From an ethical standpoint, it doesn't make sense. Um, <clears throat> so one of the, one of the biggest issues that I saw in more so like the big box personal training community is they want you to train <clears throat> in a specific manner, in a specific model, no matter how outdated that model might be, they still want you to follow the specific model. And then they try to sell these packages of, you know, six month, one year packages, several thousands of dollars, but you only meet with your trainer once a week. That didn't really make sense to me. And I didn't really like that. And so I learned 
I was like, okay, I don't, this doesn't really align with my ethics. You can make a lot of money doing it, but I didn't like that. So I left, did things more independently. And again, I had a great opportunity to do this independently, but I was able to do so in a way where I could do it with the models that I knew worked training three or four times a week with a person and doing something that was fair. And again, ethical. And then, you know, then I got into the whole group fitness franchises and I saw all the crazy things that they do there that, that don't really make sense or are unethical or, um, you know, we could talk about more about that, but I saw a lot of things on the back end of fitness that I'm like, okay, this is everything that everybody does that is wrong. How about we take this a different approach and do this in a actual helpful manner and in an ethical manner? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what prompted you to, to see, uh, or how long did it take you? I would say to see some of the faults and I guess the industry and how it both sells fitness, teaches fitness, <clears throat> talks about nutrition. Cause it took me, I mean, in all honesty, it took me five years to start to get good. It mm. took me 10 years to be good, just to really be good at, at what I did. So it sounds like- To be good at like training or like marketing? But all, I mean, just how to um, really see like, oh, these are the lies. This doesn't oh. work. This works. This is how I should communicate things. It took me a while to figure that out. Like I, as an early trainer, I would get clients and I'd just hammer them. Oh, you sure. want to get sweat? You know, when you want to sweat and get sore and take all these supplements and- Oh, right, because that's what we think works. That's right, right. Right. So how long did it take you to kind of figure that out? Sounds like you got there pretty quick. So I've <laughs> all, I've been really lucky that I always approach everything in my life with a sign with the scientific approach. So in the scientific method, when you have a claim or a hypothesis or anything, you first saw, you first seek out to disprove it. And if you have a hard time disproving it, chances are you're in the right direction. If it's really easy to disprove it, then you know that it's wrong. A lot of people go about the other way. They go into something, take their hypothesis, their claim, they try to confirm it. Mm. Anybody can do that, right? So I just, I've always had that habit of any kind of claim. All right, I'm going to go out and try to disprove this. If I have a hard time, it's wrong. If I have a hard time disproving it, it might be right. If it's easy, then it's wrong. So with everything in the fitness industry, you can kind of approach it that way. Okay, so creatine HCL is better than monohydrate. Okay, let's find out. Uh, let, let, let's try to put that to the test. Let's challenge it. And then you find, oh, wait, it's not. Okay, so it's a scam, right? <laughs> so that's just kind of how I approached everything from a really early age. And Did you drive your parents nuts? Dude, yeah. <laughs> 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 like, Mom, why is the sky blue? It just is. Yeah, but yeah. why though? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> so that's, and that, so I, really early on, I, I would say, just like I, would, I was skeptical of everything. And I, luckily, I was, because I was so skeptical, I could figure out a lot of the faults and a lot of the, the misinformation in the fitness industry. Now science will get you far, but then there's the behavioral aspect of working with people, right? 100%. Especially mm -hmm. with nutrition. Like, um, you know, we could communicate like what works, what doesn't work and, and till we're blue in the face, but getting someone to understand and to follow through and develop a good relationship with nutrition, like that's a whole nother ball game. Right. How did you figure that part out or what did that process look like for you? Yeah. So, there's a model that I run both my coaching and like how I work with my coaches with in that we, we use this model of concept literature application. Okay. So we have the general concept of what generally works. We kind of know this through empirical evidence for the past a hundred years of this space. Can we take the science mm -hmm. and find this to confirm it? But then most important, the bottom chunk, which is application. Okay. How can we apply everything that we're learning? Cause there, there's new sports and there's new sports and conditioning studies always coming out every single week. Right. Mm -hmm. But how can we apply that? And that's where a lot of people miss it. And that's where we, you know, a lot of things that we talk about may not quite coincide with the studies, but it works in the real world application. So I think there is room for anecdotes, especially in our field. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense because um, to give an example of that, this sounds silly to say now, hmm. but because uh, we've been doing this for so long, uh, strength training was when we started never considered a form of exercise for longevity. Sure, definitely not considered a form of exercise for fat loss. Sure, it was not a fat loss form of exercise. It was all about cardio, cardio, cardio. Right, and we well, didn't even have the big strength names were the big fat burly guys. Right, that's right. And That's right. There was no there, a lot. There were no really science on it anyway. Nobody right. was studying strength training for longevity. It was all about performance and how strong you could get. Right. Yet in the you know whatever in the trenches for lack of a better term, we saw you know people who worked on our gyms who just did cardio, and then we saw people who did strength training, and we saw the arc of results and mm -hmm. consistency and how it was able to mm -hmm. be maintainable. And we we know as trainers were like actually. 
this form of exercise is pretty damn good for fat loss, but there was nothing backing sure. it up. So it was all anecdote up at that point. Right. What What are some of the biggest misconceptions then if, when you get clients coming in and, you know, they, they want fat loss or they want to gain yeah. muscle? Like, what were some things you had to kind of like uh, re-educate them on? <sighs> okay, there's a lot. So probably the biggest one that I have the greatest hurdle with is I get people who... I've got back problems. I got knees problems. Mm. Okay. We're going to make you deadlift. We're going to make you squat. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. That freaks them out yeah. because they they think that they're some kind of porcelain doll and they can't put any kind of pressure on them or they're, they're going to shatter. But I have yet to have a client come to me who said they have a back issue and I've had wide range of back issues and haven't, I haven't had a single client go through within four weeks, completely eliminate their back pain with the deadlift. So there's a little bit of like, you got to trust me on this here. Um, but I do my best to educate you along the way. So, yeah. Uh, how do you feel about this? Like, cause we've seen this really weird cycle when we started, we would manage these 30,000, 40,000 square, you know, square foot gyms and they would have one squat rack yeah. <laughs> and the squat rack would have dust on it. Right. And d forget deadlifting. Nobody, I mean, I would deadlift and I, members would stop me. I'm the manager of the gym. They would stop me, but you're going to hurt your back. You know, right. what is it? What are you doing? Right. Then we saw it become popular through CrossFit. I think CrossFit did a really good job popularizing those. Now it seems to be trendy to shit on those exercises. Like, you know, you don't need to squat. Right. You right. don't need to deadlift. There's yeah. better exercise or whatever. How do you feel about those things? I mean, especially as a power lifter. I get where they're coming from. Like the, the intention is there, but the, again, the application is, is horribly wrong. And we see it, it's, it's pro it's prominent in TikTok where they say you don't need to bench press. You don't need to squat. You don't need to deadlift. Right. Mm -hmm. I get where they're coming from, but you have to remember the audience that they're speaking to are young kids, underdeveloped kids. <clears throat> I have yet to, and I put this challenge out on TikTok and I have, I'm still waiting on a response. Like TikTok, if you're listening, like I'm still waiting for you here. Um, find me one exercise that not only improves neuromuscular efficiency, trains the entire body at one time is infinitely scalable and is economical. Whereas we can use a minimal number of sets and volume and training frequency to grow the entire body all at once. That isn't the barbell deadlift. Yeah. I'm waiting. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I'm waiting. Like, Crickets. so <clears throat> I'm, I'm willing to hear it out. And so far, I, no one's found anything. Yeah. So I, again, I get where they're coming from. And like, as you get more advanced, yes, the, 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 these larger barbell movements may not have their time and place for you, but you're not there yet. Okay. You're still over here. Let's focus on these, on these simpler exercises. But I think the reason why TikTok doesn't like talking about that is because these create these content creators have to reinvent the wheel to stay relevant, to get their views. Exactly. It's not just that. It's also that you made a point earlier about how easy it is to confirm our own bias. And I mm -hmm. remember being, there's a reason why I have such a problem with that message is I remember being a teenage boy and I didn't want to squat and deadlift because it was hard. Nobody does. It was hard. Yeah. And so I, I would glom on to any coach or trainer that would say, oh, you don't need to do that. Sure. And so that's the, the problem that I have with that message is, is not, we're not talking about the six year old lady who's got all these conditions and issues that I need to address before I barbell deadlift with her. Like, I'm not worried about her. I'm worried about the 17 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old young boy that's getting into lifting and is going, oh, I don't need to squat and deadlift because my right. favorite influencer tells me this way when it's like, dude, that is the single best thing yeah. that you could probably do for your body and where you're currently at in yeah. your journey. And I wish that somebody would have hammered that home to me and I didn't wait until my mid-20s before it became a staple in my, my program. Yeah, I mean, could you imagine how much further physically you could be if you had the time, if you put in the time to like dedicate to those larger lists. I wish, I wish the same thing for myself too. Like yeah. I look at the clients that I work with and they have, we have a very, very basic, simple programming with those barbell lists and they're growing like weeds. Yeah. I'm like, man, jealous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's, it's, that's, I mean, our, uh, the, the first program was maps anabolic based off those lifts and people are, Oh my God, I've never experienced gains like this before. Yeah. But this is after they look at it and go, this doesn't look like anything fancy. I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. But <laughs> follow it. Yeah, it's like the the whole workout that is on our, t our our TikTok that is really popular right now. It's it's labeled the sticky note workout plan because you can fit it all on a sticky note. I've looked at it. It's it's just a relay. But it's version. legit. 
It's it's legit, but it's, it's better just better than ninety nine percent of the workouts that are online. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's I can't I can't claim it as mine. Uh, this is what I've gathered from like the last ten years of doing this. Sure. But it's it's simple and it's effective and it all fits on a little sticky note and you can ride that out for months and see incredible progress. Totally. So do you think that because I, I you know I remember when I really started to learn exercise programming because programming. Um, there's simplicity to it, but then there's also some complexity sure. to it. Okay. Cause yeah. it's not just, yeah, you know, people think programming is like fancy exercises. Exercises are part of it. There's reps and sets and rest periods and how they all work together in the week and how the weeks work together in the months and all that stuff. And I remember when I first started learning about it, I realized that the best strength training, at least the most scientifically backed strength training programming came from the strength sports that where people actually had to lift more weight, mm. yeah. power lifting, and Olympic weightlifting in particular, whereas bodybuilding, there's definitely science in bodybuilding, but bodybuilding so subjective right. that the best bodybuilder who wins isn't necessarily the one who's following the best programming. Sure. Yeah. But with like powerlifting and weightlifting, uh, the programming matters so much more. And you know this, you talk to a bodybuilder, you talk to a powerlifter, the bodybuilders focus much more on diet and, and the gear that are on. Powerlifters and weightlifters, you know, they're like super crazy about their workout programming. 100%. You started as a, as a powerlifter. Do you think that that gave you a huge advantage over other trainers in that realm? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, because of how analytical and how specific you have to be with your programming. Because like you said, the number one goal is, <clears throat> can I add weight to this barbell in, at the end of this mesocycle? Um and yeah, it gave me a huge advantage. And in fact, right now I've transitioned more into like a little season of bodybuilding. I want to kind of chase this vein and see how far I can go with it. And because I have a programming background, this is way more comprehensive, way more like I can, I, I'm able to see more progress at this because of that programming background. Yeah. yeah. So I totally agree with that. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I learned a that lot. That was my advantage in bodybuilding. I saw that real quick, real quick, real quickly. When I got into the space, I found how many coaches and trainers just did not have that background at all. It was no. all around diet and, and as burn as much as you possibly could and get right. shredded and what drugs could you take right. and the programming piece. I mean, when I was in, when I was competing, there was no, I had none of my peers were even deadlifting or squatting mm -hmm. at all. I mean that back, I mean, it's still, I think it's prevalent today that they believe that it's going to widen your waist. And so they don't want, you know, that's not a <laughs> being fat widens. Your waist. I, right. You know, so, <laughs> so I, I thought that was hilarious. And I remember, and we, I worked out in a gym here. That's probably one of the more popular gyms uh, for competitors. And I remember seeing all their, their programming, what they're doing like, Oh man, this is going to be a huge advantage to me. And I, I really attribute that to one of the main reasons yeah. why I scaled up to the professional level so fast is because awesome. when I looked at my peers, I was like, Oh my God, dude, these guys, don't know as much as I would expected them to know based off of the way their bodies look. So you've gone further in bodybuilding than I have. I've only done one show. So let me ask you, um, do you think your foundation of strength gave you the upper hand, both from a physical standpoint and like a training standpoint when it came to competition? My strength, not so much. My knowledge around nutrition and mm. exercise did. Okay. Because in that space, as you've, if you haven't found out, you will. The, what I found quickly, and I've told this on the show many a time, so our audience is probably tired of hearing it from me. But when I first walked into it, I was really excited. Like I thought at this point, I'm already been 10 years plus in this, in, in the, in fitness industry. Sure. Now I'm going to get into the, comp the competing side. I had no knowledge of it whatsoever. Mm. So I go in and I'm actually really excited. I'm like, man, I'm going to get to learn. I'm going to meet a lot of like, if these are the the one percent of the one percenters, like the, the best bodies in the world, I'm right. gonna get to get on stage with. I can't wait to pick their brain and find out like what and what I found was not what I was expecting at all, was a lot of them, and not to take credit from them at all, I mean, they have this unbelievable discipline, the mm -hmm. ability to starve their body for an extended period of time and take zero days off and be incredibly meticulous about counting and tracking right. that they were good at and like listening to what their coach told them. But the science to support a lot of what they were doing was just, it wasn't there. It was, a lot of it was terrible. And it, and it gave me this huge advantage of like, oh, wow. Like there were so many guys that couldn't figure out why every time they would cut for a show, then do this massive dirty bulk, why they had such a hard time getting as lean following the same principles as they did the previous one. Sure. And it's because they would allow themselves to put on so much excess body fat in this off season. They'd show up to stage and every show, it seemed like 
if they weren't create adding more and more volume or more and more cardio or dieting even harder, they couldn't achieve the same look. Where for me, every show I was improving. And I was like, I was eating more, having to do less. Like yeah. it was just, and that was just because I was, I was, I had a much more scientific approach to my programming than I saw my peers. And that was all the way to the professional level. Yeah. Most of these guys have coaches and teams that put them on radical extreme diets and just train them like crazy and, and they get shredded. And some of them have. I don't. I don't think I have a genetic advantage. I, I definitely have a swimmer's body, mm. so I wasn't built for bodybuilding. But I had the advantage of nutrition and exercise programming on on everybody, and that was what really. And I didn't have. I didn't play the political game either. I didn't hire a coach. I didn't have a team. That's kind of. It's tough to do that when you're by yourself. Mm. Like they, it, that tends to help you out a lot if you're with a big name coach or a big a big team that everybody knows. As far as like make like. Winning, yeah, help. really, oh yeah. Well, it's judged. Well, yeah, and you got, so <laughs> so the way the shows are set up, because um, I've, I've done one show and I had a, I had a coach, but he was a smaller name. It wasn't part of like a team. Yeah, so the teams are what teams and big name coaches are where it's at because ah. those guys sponsor a lot of these shows, oh. and so they are the they're the money behind a lot of these shows. Yeah, and so and they're they're you know rubbing yeah, elbows with the, the coaches like, yeah. hey, these are my five competitors. So if it was. You and another guy, and here's the thing with it, like no one could ever prove this, but you just know it if you've been in it long enough. Sure. It comes down to you and another guy, you have a small name coach nobody really knows about, and this person's working with, you know, you know, drop a big Hany name Ram bodybuilding Rod. coach, right? Yeah, yeah Hani Ram, right, right. So the big name like Hani, yeah. who's got a ton of money behind all these things, and they know that he's their, his guy, and it comes down to the two, and you guys are close enough. Yeah. Like you're not gonna be, they're not gonna- uh, They're not gonna give the last place first Yeah, place. they're not gonna give the last play like the guy's gonna sure. have to be like competitive but there's been many times where you you see the guy who has it i mean it happened in my very first show my very first show the crowd was like booing because i didn't even place the top five <laughs> and it was obvious yeah. how much more shredded i was than everybody mm. else but i nobody knew who i was yeah you were way too shredded and i've never seen this yeah. and it what happened to me so i get the audience is booing when they see i'm like in sixth place in the morning in the morning call outs and it caused so much ruckus. And I had a buddy who was working the back with people. So he came, he came and told me, he's like, Hey, they, they moved you all the way up to third. Wow. And he's like, I was like, what? I'm like from six to third, that big of a jump like that. He's like, yeah, no, like they, they got, because of the response from the crowd, everybody yeah. booing and making a big deal about it. Cause it was so obvious that I should have placed first, but they're like, Oh, we got to put this guy. We can't give him first, but we'll put him at third and make him come back for another show. And that's just how they do. That's how they run the whole thing, dude. It's on, crazy. On today's episode of Mind Pump, we're going to talk about the conspiracies of the bodybuilding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, it's extremely it's well known. It's a, oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. extremely political. That's wild, man. I had no, I had no idea. But that's crazy because like you couldn't do that with a powerlifting company. No, it's numbers. Like who right. to the most yeah, weight? You can't right. manipulate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's why. Like again, I think that's why some of the best workout programming comes out of those strength sports because. Yeah, right. You either lift more or you don't. Right. It has, you know, it's not subjective at all. It's yeah. objective. And if you lift more, people are like, okay, well, he did 50 pounds more than last time. What is his workout like? What is he doing? Right. Especially if you're in weight classes, you know, it's not like you didn't gain a lot of weight, but you got way stronger. Sure. What the heck uh, is this, you know, is this guy doing? Yeah. How, how have these powerlifting uh, programming helped you train? everyday average people? Because <laughs> I'm sure you're training people and they're not like, I want to power lift. Right. Like well, I want to get leaner. Uh, yeah. So honestly- I, I love training the general population way more than I did helping strongman and powerlifting competitors yeah. way more. Uh, I think because of the sense of accomplishment is so much greater. Like I can now help this 60 year old grandma get off the toilet without a walker versus, well, I added 10 pounds to your squat. Like it's so much cooler. Um, but it, it definitely, it definitely played a huge advantage because I, I figured out early on strength is, I believe strength is the most important physical attribute. Yeah. That you can improve. We say that exact line. All Everything time. improves when you can work on strength. It's not a two way road though. It's a one way road. So um, I was able to use a lot of those simp simplistic training principles of the barbell and use those with my general population clients. And they were able to make incredible progress, regardless if you're trying to, it changes a little bit when you want to compete and you're trying to maximize your one rep max. That's yeah. when the programming changes, but for just generalized force production and just generalized strength training, it's actually pretty, pretty similar. So, but it played a huge role. Why, why explain how strength is the most, uh, you know, important physical attribute? Yeah. So, um, 
uh, I'm going to use the use CrossFit for an example here. So CrossFit teaches the the ten. What are they called? The the ten physical. It's like the ten physical attributes, right? So if we have that list of ten, so there's like cardio, respiratory, fitness, agility, mobility, power. Uh, if we take a look at strength, which the definition of strength is the ability to produce force upon an external resistance. How much? How hard can you push on something? Your ability to maximize your force production improves mobility, improves cardiorespiratory fitness, and improves your, I should rather say, it improves your capacity to improve those other characteristics. So I use this example all the time. If we have two bioidentical runners and one squats 50 pounds, and the other person who squats 300 pounds, who can run harder? Who can run faster? Well, the person who squats 300 pounds, I would hope, right? So in the you can use it kind of like very simplistic logic with anything when it comes to strength training. Um, so that that's why I believe it's the most important physical attribute because it potentiates our ability to improve any other physical attribute that we want to work on. Yeah, that's a fact. It's the only one that carries over to every other person. Every single yeah, one. And like I said, it's, it's, a, one. it's a one-way road. I can't go do hot yoga and expect to add 20 more pounds to my squat. Right. I can't go do... Um, a, you know, spinning class and expect to be able to lift my lawnmower into, my, into the back of my truck easier. It's, it's a one way road. Yeah. Yeah. So explain how it contributes to mobility because there's, this is still a, a myth that lingers mm. in the general population, which is that you get stronger, you build more muscle, you're going to be tighter, right? You're not right. going to be as mobile. You're not so mobile. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So explain how strength contributes to mobility. So, we have to remember that a lot of people think that a lot of people think this because who do we think of? What's the person that we think of who think is like really super, super strong, a 300 pound power lifter, a 300 yeah. pound strong man. Yeah. Okay. They have to like hold their breath and brace to bend over to tie their shoe. <laughs> that's who we think of who's really strong, right. but that's not strength. Okay. That's a power lifter. That's an, a specific athlete in a specific sport. So when, we're talking about mobility. That's the ability to essentially control your position in an end range of motion under a load. Okay. So if I'm taking your squat, for example, most people have mobility issues in the squat. If I can load that squat and progressively improve your depth through that, I've improved your mobility. So I think, I think that's the biggest application is through practice and application and through programming, your mobility improves. It doesn't tighten up and lock you down. Yeah. I remember as an early trainer, just to, just to piggyback back off this, as an early trainer, I had a client hire me. This was probably two or three years into my career who was who had uh, hyper mobility. Okay. It was Ooh. what she was diagnosed with. Right. Which basically means she can like bend her elbow the other direction. Yeah. Like, yeah. like just super loose and lax. Yeah. And the reality was, uh, and you'd think, and I thought as an early trainer, flexibility mm. is what gives you mobility. Mm. Well, she was the most unstable person I'd ever trained. She could injure herself so easily because she was hyper, -mo like flexible, right? but she had no strength to support it. Kind of like in the example I use, like a baby, like you take a baby and you can fold them all over the place, but try and stand them up and, or put something on them and then they end up hurting themselves. Sure. It's real world mm. flexibility is your ability to move through a range of motion with control and strength. You need access to that. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and that's the difference too. It's like it's passive or, or it's active control. Sure. And so like, and that's the thing, there's a misconception between stretching and mobility and mobility right. really is that strength and access to those ranges yeah. of motion. Like <laughs> one of the biggest things that I always get harped on is like, cause we don't have a super rigorous mobility routine in our programming. We have mobility when it is needed. We have generalized, just kind of helping with blood flow and just keeping the air. I feel like just kind of generalized flexibility of spending a few minutes helps with joint health, mm -hmm. but that's, I, in my opinion, I think it's where it ends. And I always get harped on like, well, like I can do the full splits. Okay. And like, where in real life do you find yourself having to How do you get out of that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So you can do a full splits, but so what? Like I can safely pick up a log and not blow my back out. So real world application here, you know? Right. Yeah. We, we, uh, our minds were blown years ago when we learned, um, mobility from a friend of ours who they, he would put you in positions, but the goal was to connect to new ranges of motion through mm -hmm. tension mm -hmm. and isometrics. And the carryover from that was like mind blowing. And that's when all of us were like, okay, this is totally different. This is not what I thought when people said mobility training, which I would think of like yoga or something like that before. Right. Mm -hmm. It was about connecting 
uh, to new ranges of motion. That's cool. So yeah, it made it made a huge difference. What are some other things that you find yourself just shaking your head at when you, <laughs> you know, hear people in our space talking, you can go either diet or exercise wise, man, there's so many, I, I should have, I should have put together a list cause there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you got, I mean, you guys probably know about this one. You hear this one all the time about, uh, restricting a specific macronutrient for yeah. weight loss, you know, low carb or low fat, uh, low protein is actually on the table right now because protein causes cancer apparently. Yeah. mTOR. So. That's what they, yeah. that's what they point to. Yeah. mTOR. Right. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? <laughs> we yeah. can. Yeah. I've read the book, uh, or the, the book that kind of popularized it and I, I read through it and I saw the studies, but the, the thing that I learned from school was like interpreting studies and you know, how they came to those conclusions. I was really lucky to figure that out because going through those and reading those studies, I was like, that's not what those studies say though. No. That's what you want those studies to say. Yeah. So. No, I mean, I, the way I've broken it, I've break it, broken it down um, is that first of all, anything can fuel cancer growth, cancers sure. or cells. mTOR is a signaler of growth in the presence of cancer. Um, mTOR could tell got cancer to grow right in a healthy body. mTOR is phenomenal. It tells your muscles to grow. It, right. It's reparative. It makes you stronger and makes you feel better. By the way, estrogen, testosterone, insulin, growth hormone, thyroid, all of these uh, are normal hormones we have in the body, but in the presence of specific cancers can fuel cancer growth. Right. So what they're trying to do is trying to connect protein to cancer because protein activates mTOR, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, that's not how it works it's, right. it, it, in a pro cancer environment or in a cancer environment, anything can fuel. It's an overly simplistic approach to the very complex bio, the biochemistry of the body. Yeah. And that's where a lot of these diets kind of mess up on, especially the whole, uh, obesity insulin, the, the obesity insulin theory, mm -hmm. it's coming back with a vengeance right now on TikTok. So the whole insulin thing makes you, the insulin makes you it's fat. It's insulin that makes you fat. Right. right. So that came back with a vengeance. But again, it's an oversimplification of how complex your body works. Like it's, you're not going to manipulate one variable and expect your entire physiology to change. Yeah. You know, so, the reason why I, I don't like that one is the same thing with the, the squat. When I think of, uh, really bad information that that does so much more harm than good for people mm -hmm. I, I think of the young men that are told not to squat and then i think of this the this messaging around high protein being cancer or drives cancer because in my experience um i would say north of 90 percent of almost every client's normal general population not competitors not like any athletes like normal people right. when i assess their diet under consume protein right it's probably one of the most underconsumed macronutrients. And then you have this messaging, fear mongering people around what it potentially can do in regards to cancer. It's like, that's such a terrible message because that was already a challenge for me as a coach right. to get my clients to eat more. Then they hear bullshit like that. And then they're going to run away from me even more. So it's such a dangerous message. Yeah, yeah. It is a dangerous message. And there's a lot of them out there. And I, <clears throat> I actually encourage, I'm going to sound a little dogmatic saying this, but when we have clients come on, we, we encourage them to what I do, put the blinders on because you're going to hear us tell you to do something and you're going to go on Instagram and someone's going to say the exact opposite of what we tell you to do. And that's going to freak you out. <laughs> so we tell them, trust us on this, uninstall Instagram, uninstall TikTok just for a few months. And then you can put, and then you can put it back, even unfollow us, like unfollow us for a little bit and just like put your head down and do the work. And then you can redownload it for that exact reason. There's just, there's so much conflicting information out there and it's, it's kind of, it's disheartening and it's disappointing. Yeah. So where does, uh, where does the uh, business acumen come from? Uh, what's, what's been your journey like in, in entrepreneurship? And I mean, were you into it when you were young? Yeah. And, like, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, well, my dad knew I was going to be an entrepreneur from a very young age. Really? So oh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a funny story. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to make money and, um, I was 11 years old and I was too young to get a job. So I started mowing lawns just in my neighborhood. So I printed out little things, put them on the doors in my neighborhood and got a few calls. And I started mowing lawns like 50 bucks a month or something like that. And I was like, oh, all right, cool. So like I went even further and put them on like neighboring uh, neighborhoods. And I learned a very important thing that if you can do the, the more volume of little papers I can put on doors, the more calls I'll get, the more people I'll be able to convert into 
lawn mowing clients. So this grew and it grew to like, I, I did this every single year. It grew to where I was making like a thousand bucks a month as like a 12 year old, 13 year old kid. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so I never want to work for someone ever again. I want to work for myself. <laughs> so th that's where it all started. And from then on, it's always been like, okay, how can I, how can I fix this problem? And how can I make money off of it? Yeah. yeah. So as you know, conceited. As that so sounds. tell me what the model looks like right now for you. Cause you said yeah. something before we got on air that I thought was really interesting. You said you don't take clients any younger than 28. Is 28 that years old. Yeah. So, so explain that. Yeah. Well, our coaching is expensive because you get one-on-one -on -one direction, communication, check-ins, uh, we evaluate your lifts, we evaluate your form and we, so you are as close to a one-on-one -on -one coach as you can possibly, uh, you're as close to a face-to-face -face coach as you can possibly get. Um, that costs money. And yeah. so we, let's just face the fact, if you're under 28 years old, you're probably still trying to figure out your professional life, probably still don't have like a set job, we're probably not going to have a constructive conversation to talk about coaching yet. But that doesn't mean that you don't have help because I pride myself on the amount of free information that I post on my Instagram, my TikTok, but most importantly, my Discord. We have about 2,000 members on my Discord and my free information is better than your paid trainer's information. So you're not lost. You're not a lost hope. Wait until you're a little bit older, but take advantage of all the free stuff that we give. You can, you, you can, you can have a successful transformation with just the free stuff that we have. Yeah, and well, there's so many people who share their, their before and afters on my Instagram, just for my free stuff. And I, I post that all the time. And then I make a joke of like, my free stuff's better than your, tra than your trainer stuff. So <laughs> when did you start uh, coaching that way online like that? Um, I started like five or six years ago. We've gone full online uh, about two and a half years ago. And you said you have coaches under you? Yes. So you have a team. Mm -hmm. How many people? I've got three coaches and I've got one that is currently onboarding right now that we're training up to speed. Awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. And you, you commented earlier that you might want to train sometimes in person as yes, just to kind of keep your finger on the pulse or yeah. whatever. Talk about, talk about what it feels like to get rusty because you're not seeing people. Cause we noticed this doing the podcast, right? We're talking on the, on air and we're not talking with clients. And then we did a live event, which is not a profitable thing for us at all. If anything, it loses us money. Sure. But we did it. And afterwards, we're so, we felt so grounded and reinvigorated. Yeah. Like, okay, we got to do those for us more yeah. than anything. I'm so glad you said that because I'm looking to do a workshop in Idaho for that exact reason. I'm not going to make any money off of it, but I want to do it for me. Um, but sorry, you asked. Yeah. Wh wh why, why you had mentioned you want to train some pe people in oh, person yeah, well, to do that. Yeah. Well, because, uh, I'm, I'm rusty and I, as the face of the business and as the, the person who should be leading the industry, I hope to lead the industry. I need to be able to stay on top of my stuff, even though I have, I have a few clients here and there and I have a team of coaches who are fantastic and all my stuff is like pre-recorded, So you can go rewatch that stuff. I still feel like I have an obligation to stay up to up to par on these things. Mm -hmm. So I've even considered just coaching one-on-one -on -one for free again, more so for me than anything. Mm -hmm. So as a, as an entrepreneur, um, what's your Achilles heel? What do you suck at? <laughs> um, time management is a big one. So, that's one of the reasons why I've, I've hired a productivity coach to help me uh, get that under control. I suck at time management. So I, I'll either procrastinate something to the very last second and get it all done, or I will end up working 12 hour days. So there's no balance. So, and that's, you know, due to my own ADHD, I can't. I feel like that's an entrepreneur trait. <laughs> yeah, it's gotta I totally be. Is. I think it is. And like, it's a common thing that like people who are, have an entrepreneurial mindset also have ADHD. So I think they go hand in hand. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, yeah. what, what has been some of the greatest challenge of scaling from it? Cause it's one thing. And I remember That's in my, challenge. in my twenties starting to figure out, like I definitely was an entrepreneur. Um, mm. I was really good at making money for myself, but then I always kind of hit the ceiling uh, when it was, and it was you know, around a certain dollar amount of, you know, scaling beyond that. It gets yeah. really difficult. Like, um, are you there? Like, are you finding that like those type of challenges? Like what are some of the biggest challenges that you currently have right now within the business? I've broken my current system about five or six times. Um, and every single roadblock has been the result of, uh, not having systems or not having a big enough team. So I started with one coach to help me. Uh, and then 
we quickly maxed that out. And that's another thing too, is I've learned really early on, I have to have a cap on mm-hmm. how many clients both I and my coaches take. We can't take an indefinite number of clients because the quality of coaching will go down the higher the number goes up. Right. Right. So if we want to scale our income, we need to have more people on hand to help more. Um, that that's been like the biggest roadblock is now my mindset has changed from, okay, how much more things can I do to make more money? It's now who can I hire to that? That's better at this than me to, to help me with this, this, than than me trying to figure it out on my own. What would the ultimate vision for the business for you? What would it look like for you? Would you still be coaching a lot or would you rather be like, uh, you know, the, the puppet master on everything? Like, <laughs> how do you see yourself? It's a good question. Um, I thought I had an idea of what I wanted it to be. And it, it as it grows, it continues to change. Um, yeah. I think what I want for it at this current point in time in 2023 is uh, I would just like it to be, again, just leading the industry in strength training and body composition changes for the average individual yeah. and kind of just debunking the bullshit that's out there. That's where we see it now. And where I see myself in it is again, coaching more so to stay honed in on my craft, but more so on the business side of things, helping other coaches improve so they can be the best coaches they can be. Yeah. You have a, like a favorite part and least favorite part about what you have to do to make it all go right now. I mean, behind the content creation, all the, probably the bookkeeping and stuff that you have to do, managing other people, like yeah. what do you love and what do you not like to do out of all that? Well, all the things that I don't like to do, I've hired other people to do it for me now. So <laughs> luckily, um, <laughs> but yeah, bookkeeping sucked, um, managing messages and managing sales calls. Uh, that was, that was kind of a burnout. What I love doing, what I really love doing is teaching. And, um, so content creation for me is second nature. I love doing that. Um, yeah. Is that what drives the most leads to the business right now? Like, so take me through the process of, you know, sales calls, capturing leads, conversion, yeah. and then how does that work? The funnel is pretty simple. Um, I make really good content. I give a lot of really good free information. People think, wow, if my, if this free stuff is so good, I wonder what coaching looks like. So we have all the free stuff here. They inquire about coaching. They fill out an application, they get on a sales call. And then if they qualify on the sales call, cause it's, we don't just take anybody. We have to make sure that uh, we like you and we think that we can actually help you. Once we determine that, then you're client. So that's a really simple model. Have you had any uh, situations where you've turned someone down and they get pissed or like, what's that look like? All, for you? all the time. Okay. All the time. My favorite one I screenshot of this was uh, we ask a series of questions and there's an application that you have to fill out before they can get on a call. And the guy got mad and he canceled the application. You said, man, I've, ha- I've applied for jobs where I've asked them to give me money. That is easier than applying for your coaching. <laughs> so and I'm like, look, man, it has to be fruitful for both of us. So yeah, we do have to say no to a lot of people because it's just not going to be productive for either one of us at this time. And is the, so. the 28 thing, is that kind of like a general rule, but it's like if you had somebody who's 26, who was very successful, or is it just, you just straight up, you're not old enough. If you don't. It's, hit so it's, it's economic for sure. It's the money's a big one. And right. like, we just have, we've looked at the data of how many people we've had con- contacts with. And it's like, the percentage is so slim of you being under 28 and being able to afford our coaching, but also it's where you are in life. Like I just don't have a passion for training young 20 year olds anymore. Like I care more about the dad who's facing diabetes and is worried about not being able to show up to his daughter's wedding. Yeah. I'm more passionate about those dudes. Um, if you're early twenties, like, again, just hop on the discord, man. Like you can find all of our stuff there. I know. I find it a a very interesting strategy and really smart. Something I probably wouldn't have thought about until you just mentioned it because one of the, one of the drawbacks of being popular on TikTok or Instagram is the amount of young people that you get that are just looking for free stuff. They can't afford any of your potential products that you have. And I would imagine that if you open it up for everyone, you'd probably be bombarded on sales calls that led, led to nothing. And yeah. so by making that cutoff probably increases the conversion rate significantly mm-hmm. and doesn't wa- waste your time or your coaches. And so 100%. very interesting strategy. Is yeah. that how that came to be? Is that you start going like, dude, we're wasting yeah, our time with this kid. Yeah, well, it was. Yeah. So uh, TikTok was the worst thing that ever happened to me because we all of a sudden <laughs> got an infinite number of leads. Yeah. And I I learned really early on, we have to put these major disqualifiers on. Otherwise my sales guy's going to be pissed (laughs) because he's not making sales and my coach is going to be pissed because they're not working with people that they can help. So you know what this, you know, this reminds me of Justin, you remember, you might be too young for this. If you don't know if you're, do you remember when, uh, when Groupon hit 
Oh world. yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. And the way, so Groupon hit, um, and became, did you offer your personal training sessions? I know. Groupon? Hell no. I was okay. smart enough to see that. <laughs> yeah. So I was one of the few I did though. one boot camp with Yeah. Groupon. A lot of, okay. I destroyed okay. it. Yeah. I, I, it. I, uh, I saw a lot of coaches and trainers doing that. And to me, I saw the writing. I didn't want to devalue my coaching and training. 100%. And I, and I, and I was like, you know, even if it gets me a thousand leads and I get 10 new clients from it, I now have offered up a service that I believe is far more valuable than that. So I kind of saw the writing on the wall. Yeah. But that's what it kind of reminds me of. Like you get just, yeah, you get a ton of leads, but now you get all of these people that are, you yeah. know, want stuff for free, aren't willing to pay. And yeah. it's like, yo, know, that would a that's headache. Totally interesting parallel. I, I, I wanted to go even further in TikTok specifically and without saying like a complete dinosaur. <laughs> but I mean, we started out like primarily According on According to TikTok, I'm a dinosaur. Really? So I'm, <laughs> I'm old for TikTok. Yeah. I'm a boomer on TikTok. Yeah. So. Was like, <laughs> we were all boomers at this point uh, in their eyes. But yeah. Like, cause one, one of the biggest things that we found, uh, with Instagram was just like companies like shreds that had found all these athletes and they were kind of pushing and peddling supplements and they were doctoring photos mm. and, you know, putting out just this crazy, just archaic information. Right. Uh, is that sort of a repeated model now on TikTok that hasn't been sort of uh, addressed or what, what are you seeing, I guess, specifically like from the influencers that are real popular in that yeah. platform? TikTok's actually kind of interesting. This is something that I haven't seen before because on Instagram, yeah, you did have companies like Shreds who <laughs> they got called out for doctoring their photos and that was actually quite a clown show. But it's interesting what I'm seeing now is you have the leaders on TikTok who their only content is two things. It's debunking other creators. It's literally they have their mm. smug little face on the corner yeah. of the thing and they're like react. <laughs> yeah. It's the stupidest thing. I hate that. It's annoying. <laughs> Get your face off. Just make, make Dude, I loved. OK, so again, why are in the show? Because yeah. it was like I had that same idea because that guy with his like smug comments to yeah. his out like, you know, his little no wrong. But yeah, yeah. yeah. trying to like, add his little biomechanic right. terms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then you countered him. I'm like, oh, he did it for me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, OK. So that dude. Yeah. So and this is common. He's not the only one that does this. But but their only content is two things. It's stitching other people and it's, it's regurgitating terribly done studies and then trying to build workouts and dieting tips off of those studies. Mm. That's never been done before. And I think it's because of the nature of the platform. And it's actually quite a clown show when they get caught with their pants down when they do it the wrong way. So I don't know if you guys saw this, but last year a study came out that basically said, Overhead tricep, ex uh, overhead tricep exercises are pretty much worthless for developing the triceps. <laughs> <What>? Every single <laughs> fitness creator who uses studies as their content started making content as this is why I'll never do overhead exercise, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God. <laughs> and I was like, just sitting here, just patiently oh, waiting, shit. just waiting. And two weeks later, two weeks, I can't make this up. Another study came out. Overhead tricep exercises are the best yeah. exercise. It, it loads <laughs> it in a stretch position. Yeah. And I was like, hypertrophy. this is beautiful. And then all of a sudden everyone just went quiet. Nobody talked about it ever again, but I saw it happen. And I was like, this is hilarious. Whoa, wow. So oh, that's funny. I love, I love well, that's uh, an example of these. I mean, this is just, I think, I don't know if it's just, it's everywhere, not just TikTok, where, you know, new jacking right you try and hop on like a new study and stuff yeah. like that and mm -hmm. you double down on something like that and you fuck yourself so i think it's hilarious <laughs> yeah, yeah i think it's hilarious what's too. what's what's what makes fitness so challenging for uh, i guess coaches and trainers with integrity is it's so easily sold uh visually mm. so look at me i'm ripped that's the I'm, credibility yeah like i look mm -hmm. good or whatever but it's so terribly uh it's it's so ineffective unless it's kind of long form, mm. like you're a trainer, you've coached people for a long time. You're not going to effectively coach or train someone with one TikTok clip right. or one caption under Instagram. When you work with people, it's like conversations over time right. and over time, they start to kind of figure things out and apply things. So that's what makes it so damn tough. So the people with the most pull, and this is what frustrates the hell out of us, the people who get like reach the most people are really good at the visual stuff, mm -hmm. but their their information is not just worthless. Uh, oftentimes, it's detrimental. It's misleading. And, yes, I mean, it's misleading, but also it's also out of context because yes. a lot of things that I've seen the, the their points may be 
true, but it's so grossly out of context. And you know, the average layman will take that information yes. and treat it as gospel. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I see is so dangerous. And that's kind of where I found myself on TikTok is kind of laying the groundwork of like, yeah, okay, sure. But what about this here? Like, this is your foundation. Can we focus on this again? But unfortunately that doesn't. So. Yeah. Like the whole morphology argument for squats. Well, everybody's hip, some hip joints look like this and therefore right. the, the, okay. Like that's like, so I've trained so many people yeah. and you know how, how many times I've had to be like, well, it looks like we can't squat because your morphology <laughs> is never, yeah. right. it's never happened to me before. Right. So, you know, they'll take something that's got some truth in it, but then they'll communicate it in a way. And then the average person will read, will hear it, read it, and then just confuse the shit yeah. out of people. Right. And it's super, uh, super frustrating. This is why we chose podcasting, by the way, because it's long form. Right. You can uh, actually get your point across. Yeah. And yeah. it's a conversation. Like right. I can talk about. Because, you know, how many times I've talked about fat loss on the show, you know, how many episodes are we at now, Doug? It's like, you know, yeah. thousands of times, but that's how many times you have to talk about it before sure. it actually works. It doesn't work um, the way fitness is. Usually so is that sold. what you use Discord for primarily is the long form, your ideas? <sighs> yeah, exactly. it. Yeah. So um, we, we use TikTok as, you know, getting eyeballs and it's a necessary evil to get people to see me. And then we use Discord more so as here is the... L Here's the actual conversation of how to get strong, why we use these exercises. Here's how the programming works. And so we're able to kind of gravitate people over there and they actually learn from over there. So, so are you like, are you good. doing like almost like a podcast format in there? Is that what you're doing? Where you're talking to the camera for a half hour, hour about we, topics? Like we have, yeah. So we, we're currently working on like modules. So modules of, you know, the basics of training, the basics of nutrition, and then building those out. So they're like five, 10 minute long video segments with uh, worksheets and homework items that you have to do. And then what I'll do every week is I'll do a live Q and A with my discord. So, answer. and that's all free. Nice. All free. Oh, wow. Wow. That's yeah. phenomenal. That's yeah. incredible. I'm telling you, man, my free shit is better than most trainers. Stuff. Well, I mean, I, you, I mean we went through your stuff. Yeah. You're, yeah, you yeah, got so good stuff. And well, you're also touching on, um, I mean, that was the strategy that built this yeah. was when we first, I mean, we knew nothing about podcasting. None of us were media guys. We are, we are boomers. We didn't, none of us had, Instagram, Facebook, none of that shit. Sure. But we saw the opportunity to provide more free, valuable information than what people were putting behind paid walls. You had these eBooks that were being sold that were trash. Yeah. You had just <laughs> terrible information everywhere. Yeah. And overpriced coaching for people that didn't know what they were doing. And we we're like, man, we have all this experience. Let's just, let's just give away all this information and just sure. see if we can first build a network of people. And then we'll talk about if we have a business or not. Did you know, did you notice though, that as you did that, the more people you help, the more money you made? Yeah. Of course. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, absolutely. It's a direct result. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly. I think so many people go about it the other way. Like right. they, they have to create their secret little yeah. system that With they discovered wall. and, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. like sign up for, sign up for this <laughs> webinar and I'll sell you into my $2,000 thing at the yeah. end of the webinar for my secret thing. Whereas patented exercise. Pat yeah. Right. right. Like I discovered <laughs> like the secret thing. system, seven stage shredded system. No, dude, you didn't discover anything. No, yeah, this, no. the story that I share about when we first started to monetize, it was after a year of doing the podcast, we'd already put out 200 something episodes and when, and we had already Sal had created maps anabolic before we all even got together. So we had a product to sell a line ready, ready to go. go. Mm. And we didn't do it for over a year. And when we finally did it, it was after we were getting people that were just trying to give us money. Like it literally got to that point where we had helped so many people for free that people were like, wait, can I buy something from you? Can yeah. I, can I do a Patreon? Can I donate? Like what? Yeah. And when we started to see that, like, okay, it's time, it's time for us to, right. to do this. And then when we mm -hmm. launched it, I would say, 50% of the people actually bought and said, I, I'm not going to use it. I don't care. Like I'm literally doing it purely out of support because you've given me so much free content. Yeah. And so I share that with other content creators that that should be your mindset. It's just like, can you first prove that you have enough free, valuable content that you can grow a community of people? And then you can talk about what type of business that right. you want to build around that. So the problem with that though, is it takes knowledge and time. Yeah. Mm. And that's what a lot of people don't have. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. well I, so here's the big challenge that we see, Braden, and this is why we have you on the show is that we're trying to, and I see you do the same thing. Okay. We're trying to sell the right information better than the other guy can sell the wrong information. Now that sounds, if someone hears that, they think, 
Well, yeah, of course you could sell the right information easier. No, 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 not in fitness. <laughs> no. Because that guy tell, is telling you, you could take this pill and lose 30 pounds right. in 30 days. Right. And I'm telling you, it's going to take you a year. It's going to take lifestyle change. It's going to take, you know, behavioral modifications and it's going to suck yeah. and it's going to be hard and there's going to be ups and downs. How the hell am I going to sell that? over what they're selling, which sounds like, again, take a pill. Right. And Magic. So, so yeah. what, so what's your, like, what's your strategy with that? Cause that's who you're competing against. You're not, yeah. com you're competing against people selling easy, take this supplement, do this secret thing. Look how awesome I look, look at my butt, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you no, know, it takes hard work. This is the right information. <sighs> I think I have to give credit where credit is due. And I think people are becoming wiser now. I think people are starting to wise up that it's not a pill. It's not the TV product that you buy and then you throw under your bed after a few months of using it. Um, and what I do is I've kind of mixed a little bit of the strategies that people use to kind of catch the eyeballs. And then I've thrown my own twist into it of knowledge. I throw up the snapshot of me at, you know, 8% body fat to get you to look. And then we give you the information. Yeah. Okay. And it's so cringy when I do it. I hate doing it because that's so annoying, but I have to, because that's the only way I can get you to watch. But as soon as I can get you to watch and then I can feed you the good stuff. That's when I see it's actually beneficial. Yeah. So that's the exact same model. We mm -hmm. use. That's I what mean, we do. We use my, my transformation into bodybuilding. I built the first original 10,000 people paying attention to us off of my way. I looked Yeah, knowing that I had to get your attention, yeah, you know, hot as hell. <laughs> <laughs> it was that bear rug pick that really got, Oh me. my God. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's funny though, that I'll, I'll never forget that journey of doing that. How, how frustrating it was. It was a necessary evil but the uh, the attention that you get for that uh, versus like your knowledge is is different. So sure. like it was mm -hmm. a it was a it was a rough road to start off. And I, I remember seeing that I had 10,000 people paying attention to us and to seeing how little that converted into business and revenue initially mm. was rough. But to your point. Uh, it was enough to get people to pay attention. Yeah. And then if I could get a percentage of you to come over and listen to the three of us talk in long form, you might go, hmm, hmm. these guys know a few things about working here's, out. Here, yeah. Here's uh, here's one thing I'll tell you that, that uh, you know, has worked well for us uh, in the past is uh, predicting what is about to come through the space hmm. and what's about to get popular and dismantling it before it gets popular. Mm. Now, this isn't like an initial, like an immediate, like we're going to you know, grow from it. Sure. But when you do this enough times, it really, yeah. you end up looking like a wizard. Now, the truth is we're not wizards. It's just obvious to anybody who knows. You can see what's all happening. cyclical. Yeah. So yeah. like, like, so like, like overhead extension example. Yes. Yeah. Or like fasting. Okay. When fasting became a big thing, yeah. all of us are like, oh, just wait. The fasting yeah, supplements are going to come. Fasting. <laughs> and it's yeah. going to be the next, Nonsense. it's going to be the next diet. When right. we were trainers, it was called, you're not eating right, right. now. They call it something else. Yeah. And so we, we would do episodes that say fasting will make you fat. Now, does fasting make you fat? No, but can it? Yeah, maybe through some dysfunctional relationships with food type sure. of deal. But calling it out and saying, hey, here's guess what? This is what the industry is about to do with fasting. Yeah. And here's why it's a terrible idea for a diet. And here's why, you know, you shouldn't do it for weight loss. And here's why it actually existed uh, throughout all of history. And calling it out before it happens yeah. has been a really effective strategy for us. So just just something that I think you probably do really well too. Yeah, because you, you can probably. See it all. I don't know if you noticed because you guys are pretty young on TikTok right now, right? You're yeah. Still, you started what like a few months ago, maybe. No, I mean, no, we, no. to be honest, these no, nobody in here even knows what goes <laughs> on our TikTok. So we, we put our clips we, on there. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you guys yeah. aren't you guys aren't aware of the animosity that happens to you guys on? Oh, platform. dude. Thank God. I, literally, so. I, that's I, actually oh, yeah. I am aware enough to know that I don't go on there because of that. Well, <laughs> we exactly. had already been doing this for long. We've seen it, and then we thought. We had, we had we thought we had proved that we're like one of the authorities in the space until we start TikTok and I went not to the sixteen year olds. Oh, fuck these guys! And so, <laughs> yeah. Literally, I just I looked at it one day, went through like how many negative shit comments we had yeah. on it, and I'm like, I can't go on this. You so, got to take an antidepressant after you look. Yeah, at the so I like yeah. I mean, I can't imagine like I, someone in your spot or someone who has built and actually been in the trenches of TikTok. Because I don't, I mean, I, we used to think YouTube was terrible, right? Remember when we used to think YouTube was vicious? Yeah, yeah. YouTube was pretty vicious to us when we first started, but nothing like no, tic, not TikTok, TikTok is. TikTok, it, I, I'm telling you, if I didn't have my stoic philosophy to help me, I, <laughs> I, I would, I'd be jumping off a bridge right now. Yeah. I'd be taking a bath with a toaster. So, um, 
Yeah. So bringing your point up, like fasting makes you fat. What TikTok creators will do is they'll stitch that. Just that. They'll stitch it. And then they'll be like, this guy's an idiot. This is wrong. Yeah. This is what he is. And it's like, hmm. I actually said that, like yeah. <laughs> I actually yeah. said that, but unfortunately because that, that one little segment yep. like yes. supported something and yep. made you look like an authority. No context. No know, context at all. Just... The one that you guys, they like, yeah. I got like 20 tags on one of your TikToks where it's like you said you use lightweights to build muscle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> that people blew up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, guys, come on. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I specifically don't stitch things because like, I'm not going to feed into this. Like, Anyway. Yeah. Context completely missing. This is like political game. Yeah. That's what politicians do with each other. hundred you know percent. I mean, saying? there is there, if you can handle the negativity, there is, there is some tr tremendous value. Cause to your point, that was one of the viral clips that was done of us on TikTok, and it does get a lot of eyeballs. And, mm -hmm. it, and if it, if it gets, let's say it gets, you know, a hundred thousand views or whatever like that. And you know, we get 50,000 sh you know, shit butts that are making negative comments, but I get, 1,000 people that now sure. listen to the show because they're curious about what we say. I mean, and if you actually listen to that whole conversation, you hear us completely explain the entire thing and you go, oh shit, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Right. And then if you actually go take that information and apply it to your own workout, it'll blow your fucking mind. <laughs> so yeah. uh, we know that, okay, it's a necessary <laughs> evil, but the hardest part is actually dealing with the negativity. I can't mm. imagine being a young, and thank God I'm, you know, I'm in my forties and yeah, we're wait, secure enough. Yeah, we're but sure. man, that would care be, less about these yeah, that would, I remember how I was in my teens and twenties. I was a very insecure young man. I can it's, only imagine what the young audience has to deal with. with oh. TikTok. It is, you know, you have people who say, Oh, cyber bullying is not a real thing. Dude, man, I've, I've been on that side and I've seen it. And again, like I'm more secure than a 16 year old, but as a formative child, Man, that stuff is toxic. It is. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. so okay. So you're about to be a father. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, yeah, congratulations. So, yeah, yeah, very, very exciting. Yeah. Um, uh, all of us in here are. I was the one who thought he was not going to be for a very long time. So I'm a, Same. Late, a late father. Oh, really? You too, dude? Yeah. When we weren't trying is when we had him. So. Oh, no kidding! <laughs> wow. Yeah. Did oh. you not want to be a dad, or were you not ready? No, no, no. It's not that. <sighs> so we we tried for like a year. And nothing came of it. And so we just kind of like, yeah, whatever, whatever happens, happens. We kind of gave up. And like my wife stopped, like she, she would get, she would get disappointed every time it wouldn't happen. Yeah. Um, and so she kind of just like gave up and like the minute that we stopped caring and I kind of accepted that I wouldn't be a dad that wild is when she got pregnant. So to anybody who's struggling with fertility, stop caring. You know, I, there's you th that's such a good point because especially on the, the, the wife side, because if she's stressing about it like that, like mm. I really, that, so we had the same story. So for a year we were trying, we said, well, uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. She had like this, this cyst removed that we had, that she had on there that they didn't know that was on her for like mm. nine years. And then like the next time, and we had already oh. kind of like, Oh, chalked it up. We're probably going to be the couple who doesn't have kids and we were okay with that. We enjoyed each other so much. Yeah. And so then it eventually happened, but awesome. point, point of bringing that up. Um, and this will definitely be, um, on your mind 24 seven, if it's not already is raising this child mm. uh in this time of mm. TikTok and social media and so what are some of the things that and are you as a father already thinking about you know how you want to introduce this this young infant into this this digital world it's interesting because you asked that you asked that question because um uh, i don't know how much we need to stay on fitness but we don't we don't okay have yeah, we can go anywhere we want so my wife and I came from a very religious families. Yeah, I've seen you do a video on you stepping away from that. Yes. Yeah. And in the specific religion that we were in, our entire identities and our entire futures and how we're supposed to raise families was constructed around that religion. So abolishing that kind of left us with this big gaping hole of how do we raise a child? And so we've had to have a lot of conversations and moments of meditating and studying of how are we supposed to raise a kid with these concepts of morals without a deity or without this concept of like a God? Like, how do we, how do we do that? And so it's been, it's been on my mind and I don't, I don't have an answer yet. I hope I can come Ooh, up. What a very, okay. You're, this is a really cool topic because man, we just went to a, are you familiar with Jordan Peterson? Absolutely. Okay. So yeah. we, we just went to one He's of my his, second father. I swear. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> so you'll really appreciate this. Yeah. So he, this was, check this out. Now you only got to hear this on his, this was a live thing that he did and he, and he asked this question and he was asked, um, if you could go, if you were raising a kid today, mm. what would like an infant starting over, what would you go about and what would you do different? 
You want to know what he said? Mm. Take my kids to church on Sundays. Wow. But his his reasoning behind that I thought was brilliant, and it actually so I kn- yeah I've heard his reasonings behind this, and it's because not- it hits what exactly what you're saying right now right. is you know, kind of the whole, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater type of mentality is just like, okay, we've agreed that we don't agree with a lot of what this religion wants us to adopt. And so uh, we're, we're done with it. But man, were there some really solid things that were come from that for raising a child and a family? And, and what are you going to replace it with? And then what are you going to replace that with? And, and so and he went on this little tangent about, you know, these, these parents that, you know, like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to like indoctrinate my child with religion, uh, you know, every Sunday and make them do that. And then he goes, okay, well then what are you replacing it with on Sunday morning? At, right. You know, right. and you know, and I mean, be honest about that. Like, let's be honest. If you're not doing that, are you doing something that is laying some sort of structure and, and moral fabric for them? Or are you just like uh, watching Sunday morning cartoons or doing nothing, right. nothing at all? And right. so there is some value to that structure. And so how, do, how do you potentially do that? So it's, a, and I don't have an answer yet, but I, I can't deny that religion has served as a heuristic to create good people. Just like how diets serve as the heuristic to lose weight. That's all it is, is a, is a heuristic. They all work on the same mechanism, caloric deficit. So I recognize that with religion that they work to create good people. They do their best to create good people. And so I, I, again, I don't have an answer yet and I hope I can come up with an answer. Yeah. What's interesting is with, with human behavior is if you don't lay something down for your kids, that's then someone else will or something else will. I agree. That's the crazy thing. You know, that's something I wish I understood because I have two, I have have two sets of kids. I have two kids from uh, my first marriage and then two younger ones. And uh, I became much more spiritual or religious with my second uh, ones. Mm. And with my first ones, I wasn't. And what it did is it left an, uh, it was, it left an open door for other ideas and things Mm. to come in. And now that's something that I have to deal with and work through. So uh, I think a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll figure it out and they'll see what this like. Listen, there's a lot of poisonous ideas, right. especially today yeah. out well, in the world. The irony crazy. coming from you too, I don't know if you know this or not, but he was a staunch atheist before. Mm. Yeah. So you have, we all have different backgrounds with all that too. So I grew yeah. up in a very structured and strict religious home with a lot of hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. And it was just, for me, I, I got into my- I'm sure that's even worse too. Yeah. So then I get, so I went the opposite direction, right? I get into my twenties and I'm like, I want fuck nothing to do with that. Like mm-hmm. I, I started to meet people that were outside of the religion that I thought were better people. And so mm-hmm. I thought, why, why do I want to go down that same path? And so I went the opposite direction for probably a decade before I found myself coming back, but I came back in a different way. Like I don't go to church every Sunday or anything like that, Sure, but I do value some of the, the morals uh, and, and values that come from what I learned as a child. And I have found as an adult that the years that I strayed away and was so like, ah, fuck it. I don't want nothing to do with it. How much, headache and drama and and shit that I had in my life. And the closer I actually live my life to some of the principles that are found in there, I find that I have a, a, a much more healthier, happier, mm. fruitful life. And so I'm in this, this area in my life of like, okay, how do I take a lot of that and, and then foster that within my child and not allow my, cause man, if I would have had my kid in the twenties, uh, in my twenties, I would, he would have got me in those, those areas where we're like, no, we ain't doing all that. We ain't, that, that's sure. not where, the way direction we're going. And sure. so I think that would be a mistake. And then you, you have Sal who again was, you know, atheist and then is come around different. Justin is similar. Doug is similar to me as far as like we were raised that way. Um, but as fathers, it, it it's really changed the way I look at it. I didn't look at it the same when it was just me. And I'm more and like, I've already gone through all that. I've already got the information and knowledge from it. So I feel, but then when you have another human being that you're taking care of and then thinking like, Hmm, I may remove all of those things from his life. Right. Um, what am I going to replace it with to make sure? And then do I have the capacity and bandwidth to, to actually be disciplined enough to do that? Because as you will find out, um, entrepreneurship and raising a child. <laughs> when you time, mentioned time management, yeah, like, and you had and, told us earlier you were right, right, battle. And oh time, my God. <laughs> right. And so, Dude, you know, and hard. of course, you, yeah. you know, someone like you Crash will course. rise to the occasion and figure it out. 
But then there's those things like that, that, you know, are important to you, but maybe on the back of your mind of, you know, oh, I should do that. or need to do that. And those tend to be the things that you probably, oh, disregard or I'll get around to it or whatever, which I think now it would probably be a mistake going, then this is speaking from my personal mm. journey, but I find that it's a really interesting conversation because I don't think that I have the full answer for you either, but I do think it's worth pondering and really thinking about because- um, It sounds like you are. Yeah. I'm thinking a lot. And that's the thing is I'm not dogmatically attached to any method or any, I, I cause I, I am willing to accept, I don't know. Yeah. And I'm hoping to have some kind of an answer and I'm hoping to, I, cause I want to raise my child to be a leader among men. And that's what this generation, this world needs. And how do I do that without the structure that I was raised with? Because I can, I see how terrible and toxic the structure was to me. Um, and how terrible it is to other people. So how do I do that? And I'm, yeah. I want, I want to raise him with morals. I want him to also be raised with finding his own answers to questions. I don't want to give him the answers to questions. So yeah. Did you come from a big family? Big family, five kids. Oh, oh wow. wow. Where, where, where are you youngest, on that? You said oldest. Oh, you're the oldest. I'm the oldest. Yeah. Uh, no, he said he was the runt. Oh, I'm the yeah. run of the litter in the farming in community. The farm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So are they all the, the big kid, big bunch of big siblings or what? They don't, everybody. Uh, yeah. They're all grown up. I got one who I think he's 17 years old now. So he's last one at home. <laughs> so my parents will be empty nesters here pretty soon. So this is what that, so when I picture, so what'd you do on the farm? I mean, this, this is like legit farm work. We, yeah. So we, it was more crop. It wasn't any kind of like the animal stuff. So we did hay, uh, hay uh, we did straw, potatoes, corn, watermelon, beans, green beans. I'll tell you this right now, okay? If you ever have the opportunity to have, you got to do this right at the right time. So when the sun is barely coming over the horizon, have a green bean right off the stalk. It's the sweetest, most delicious green bean you'll ever have. <laughs> okay. Something about when the sun rises, the sugars extract into from the stalk into the green bean. Super tangent, but like that just reminded me, like those are the best be green beans I've ever had in my life. Oh, that's great. What, yeah, so I, I, I'm imagining you got your work ethic for learning yes. that on a farm. Yeah, I'm so grateful that I was yeah. able to work on a farm because, yeah. yeah, and I want, again, I'm going to have my kids work on farms because there are, again, invaluable lessons that come from learning and get to get dirty and get hurt and fall off yeah. the back of a truck going five miles an hour. So there's some lessons Dude, you can learn. Pain us like uh, one day, like if, if it's harvest day, whatever it is where you start at like your, was it four or 5 AM and then work all the way till. Uh, like yeah. We had to get as much done cause it's in Utah. So it gets hot. So we had to get much as much done before the sun was in the, like at noon as possible. So we ended up some days we have to get up at like three in the morning. Some of our hardest days were where we would have to gather up the, the bales of hay and we didn't have balers that we could do it for us. So we, you know, we had five or six kids out there grabbing them by the, by the ropes, throwing up on the truck bed. And you know, some big kids could do it like one swoop and I'm over here like, <laughs> <laughs> so real good at clean and yeah. Out. Right. Yeah. So, and then also dealing with hay allergies on top of that, it wasn't very friendly, but that was, there, there were rough days, man, but I learned a lot from those and I'll never, I wouldn't trade them for anything. What do you, how do you feel about the, what feels like, cause we've, we've talked about this on the show. It feels like all of a sudden fitness, uh, well, nutrition, but fitness now is becoming politicized where yes. nutrition, I've never seen this before. Now I know nutrition is one of those things that you could like, what do they say? Don't talk about religion or politics. Nutrition sometimes can be like that. People can be right. real weird about, about nutrition. Right. But I mean, it's been politicized in the sense that um, all of a sudden, if you eat a particular way, you're a bad person. Mm. You're killing the earth. You're whatever. Um, or toxic. You're toxically masculine. Mm. Uh, and now I've seen it with gyms and with fitness. Yeah. It makes men toxic. And it's, you're fat phobic if you're fit. You're fat phobic. Yeah. How do you feel about all this? I don't really care. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's a great attitude. I'm sorry. I, yeah. I, I've got other things to worry about. Like yeah. I'm too busy helping people and making money. Like I don't have time to worry about this other stuff. Okay. Well, so, that's a smart way yeah. to approach it. Yeah. For I, sure. I, sorry. It wasn't made for good content. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it is a great attitude around it. And, and honestly, it's, it's such bullshit that it, it, it doesn't even probably warrant your attention. I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's a, a really good attitude about it. And instead of getting, you know, uh, all scared that Alarmed it's going to sh it. sh yeah, shift. It's just like, ah, it's clickbait bullshit. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I've, die. I've seen this happen so much for like the last 10 years of like, you know, vegan, you have, like, if, if you're vegan, then you're doing it because you don't want animals to die. And like, but then like, if you're a carnivore, you're actually helping the planet by eating more animals. It's like, 
I don't, I don't really care. I'll just, I'll focus on something else for now. Things that actually matter. I don't know. Do you, uh, do you take your clients through different types of diets and what does it kind of look like when you onboard somebody nutritionally? Like how does the coaching look? So again, down to the qualification process, we kind of weed out a lot of the people who wouldn't fit into the specific generalized mold that we have for our coaching. So I don't work with people who are vegan. I don't know how to help you. Um, I don't work with people who can't eat red meat. Again, I don't know how to help you. So a lot of the dieting principles that we use actually stem from the vertical diet. Um, I worked with Stan for a long time. And oh, I didn't know you worked with Dan. Yeah. I mean, Stan, yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, he's on a, a couple of my podcasts and met him a few times and he's awesome dude. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. Very nice guy. Anyway. So, uh, I mean, the ver- if we want to talk about like religious dogmatism and diets, I think the vertical diet is the only real diet out there that serves my purpose and what we're trying to do with our, with our clients. So we, we follow that general framework while still allowing for it, It's more not completely attached to the vertical diet. As you know, it's rather strict on what you can, can what you can and can't eat. We follow a more like 80, 20 approach, but depending on how, literate the person is when it comes to nutrition tracking calories those kind of things it will it'll be on a sliding scale of how either dialed in and strict or how flexible they they'll be so does that answer your- yeah so when you so like take me through i'm a client i fill out the onboarding thing yeah. uh i'm not a vegan i'm i'm open to like your your coaching and training sure how does, okay, how do you land on this is what you're going to eat? This is the calories. Is there, is there a process that you go through? Do you write out? Does every coach write out a custom diet for that person? Or is there some sort of, let me see what you do first? Like, what does the, the process look like? Yeah. So when most people come into my program, they've already applied the dieting principles I want them to apply for my free stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it, again, it kind of sets us up for success so that we can, we can just hit the ground run and we can get to work. So what we do is we first, we use a calorie calculator one time for the entire lifetime of that client to figure out their maintenance. That's it. And then we have them eat at maintenance. And we call this the the prime phase because what I'm looking to do is prime you for a successful fat loss transformation. You have to prove to me that you can handle a caloric deficit before we actually get you into a caloric deficit. So you need to prove to me that you can stick to your meal plan. You can eat the foods that I want you to eat. You can stay consistent as many days out of the week as you possibly can before we can pull the food down. Because if you can't stick to it when the food is high, you're not going to stick to it when the food's low. Hmm. So uh, we start there. And then once they've actually proven to us they can handle this, a lot of them actually end up losing weight when they do that for some reason, uh, which is cool. If you can get them to eat more calories and they lose weight, you look like a wizard. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always happen, but it's really cool when it does. So we have them eating at maintenance. They don't really lose weight. They maintain as expected. And then we drop them into uh, kind of a a calorie deficit. So um, we pull calories from primarily uh, fats and carbohydrates. We keep protein kind of at the same number throughout the entire diet. And then what we do is, is kind of an undulating model of dieting. So we only get them to lose about 10% of body weight at a time. So because from what I've seen, both anecdotally and empirically, past 10%, we start to see some negative things happen, both physiologically and mentally. So we lose 10%. We go into a little bit of a diet break, depending on how long the, the dieting phase was. We'll determine how long the break is. We'll bring calories back to maintenance, lose another 10%. And so it's that kind of undulating model of maintenance, 10%, maintenance, 10%. And then once the job is done, we've only done half the job. Losing half, losing the weight's only half the job. The next thing that we do is kind of a reverse diet approach. Um, I don't really call it a reverse diet because it's not that progressive model of like slowly adding back calories. I just want to get back to maintenance as quickly as I can. And then from there, we teach you how to take what you've learned and apply it to real life without having to stick to a meal plan for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. So that we've intuitive eating type of deal. Yeah. So we've dieted you down and we've dieted you out and I never want to see you ever again. Mm-hmm. So that's Very a great approach. Cool. Yeah. 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 What's, how's the success rate with that? Um, it's pretty good. Um, if you follow it, if you follow it, and that's the problem is a lot of people don't have <laughs> patience. Do yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So we have a lot of people who don't have the patience to finish the job, but then we also don't have people with patience that like they lose the weight then they think they're done. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, hang on, man. I, I I know you're excited. I know you're like ready to go, but we're not done yet. Okay. We still need to like get you back up to maintenance and show you how to like maintain this. And most importantly, get you off the meal plan. Cause I don't want you on the meal plan for the rest of your life. So. No, they can't. Nobody's going to be on a meal plan unless you're no. orthorexic. 
Well, unless you're like us, like yeah. we, yeah, we, my fitness pal is our best friend. Right. So yeah. I don't want you to have to do that. Yeah. So you had mentioned, uh, like, uh, you know, I won't work with a vegan or someone who can't eat red meat. What are some other like easy disqualifiers when people go through? Um, if your gym is purple, <laughs> <laughs> that's the horse that doesn't have a of barbell. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's in the marketing is if your gym is purple, please don't apply. So <laughs> does it really say that it says that? Yeah. No, it doesn't it, look, pull up my application Shut right now. Up, so it's, it says, um, oh, do dude. you have access to a barbell? Hint, if your gym is purple, please log out. Like, it's, Oh, my God. That's, yeah. that's Smith comical. Machine's a disqualifier. That's it's comical. a disqualifier, man. You have to have access to a barbell, a rack, and a bench. I respect oh, that. Oh, God. Yeah. I Excellent. love that. So, I love that. Yeah. Well, good deal, man. This has been a lot of fun, brother. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm glad we had you on the show. Good luck with everything you're doing. We hope this episode brings you a lot more people. Yeah, this and, is fun. Uh, yeah, we'll continue to support. Yeah, we'll stay man. in contact because, uh, I think you know, again, our, our goal is to uh, work with a lot of good people, and hopefully we can drown out all the – shitty right. stuff that's out there <laughs> and for the audience i think that right after this i believe that you're shooting with our guy to do a bunch of clips so you guys will be on mind pump tv so you get a chance yeah, some, to see some of uh some fitness stuff yeah some yeah. fitness stuff from you yeah, so it'll be cool yeah, thanks yeah. for coming on man, right on, man. yeah i appreciate Great it guys stuff. thank you today we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong well-developed chest when i think of you know, weak points and, and areas that i struggled with developing for a, a really long time chest was up there with the yeah it was part. for me it was for me for sure i got more caught up in the weight i could lift versus how i was developing my body i think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique 